The 2011 movie Snowtown depicts the real events that occurred in the rundown suburbs of Adelaide, Australia, between 1992 and 1999. The biopic centres around the relationship of John Bunting and Jamie Vlaskis, one of three sons of Elizabeth Harvey. The movie begins with Jamie and his brothers, like so many others in the town, are victims of sexual assault. When the police are reluctant to intervene and with little police presence in Snowtown, charismatic protagonist John Bunting is welcomed into their lives as the father figure they never had. Morally misguided Jamie is lured into his world and so begins the pursuit of justice to restore the absence of order in their lives. Bunting initially acts as the protector and saviour in the unjust world that Jamie lives in and soon becomes a mentor to indoctrinate Jamie in his twisted reality as a self-proclaimed judge, jury and executioner, leading Jamie to be orchestrated in retaliation towards Bunting's enemies. However, over the course of time, Bunting's primary motivations become unclear, initially hunting the socially perceived undesirables to then preying on the personally perceived undesirables. Bunting's need to satiate his vengeful appetite begs to question, how do we understand moral crimes? How do we arrive at justice through punishment? What is punishment's justification? Are those who stand by idly and watch injustice happen as guilty as those who commit it? When is moral agency suppressed? In this video essay, an attempt will be made to understand the motivations of Bunting throughout the movie and how he dominated the minds of those around him. This is Conceptualizing Control. Walter Reckless's 1967 containment theory, a vein of strain theory, provides a balanced insight into the amount of control present in an individual's life that may motivate a criminal lifestyle. Various push and pull factors tempt people into criminality, and unless these impulses are challenged by internal and external containment, then criminality will result. The pull factors are social pressures and reflect interpersonal conflicts in the form of inequalities, group conflicts, and delinquent subculture. Alternatively, the push factors are the personal pressures that push individuals towards criminality and reflect an intra-personal conflict in the form of hostility, discontent, rebellion, inadequacy, and inferiority. Lest the external and internal containments can subdue the push and pull factors, then the individual will be led into criminality. External containment refers to the sociological containment factors through the means of organizations, role models, supportive relationships, ego bolstering, and group reinforcement. Whereas internal containment refers to the personal containment factors such as self-perception, retention of norms, goal orientation, frustration tolerance, and internalization of rules. Containment theory can be used to explain how the scarcity of control snared Jamie into villainy. The external containment in reference to the movie can only be recognised to function in a contradictory manner to which is intended. The factors that should act as a buffer to safeguard against criminality only serve to enhance it. Organisations are only present in two forms, meetings and church congregations. However, the agenda for meetings is the pursuit of vigilante justice, and the church congregations do not seem to offer cathartic relief. The supportive relationships are non-existent, only provided initially to Jamie as his indoctrination begins. Throughout the movie, Bunting is the only role model Jamie is exposed to, and who acts as an overseer in methods of how to extract revenge. The group reinforcement portrayed includes positive punishment and positive reinforcement. Bunting provides positive punishment, giving a punishment to stop behaviour, exemplified when Bunting slams Jamie's head into a window for drug use, and positive reinforcement, giving someone a reward to encourage the repetition of a behaviour when he is given the credit card of a victim. The reinforcement is present, but in a contradictory manner to which is intended. 
As demonstrated, the flawed functioning of external containment is emblematic of insufficient control. The internal containment can only be viewed in a paradoxical sense to which it should be portrayed. One can only assume that Jamie's self-perception is devoid of anything resembling positivity, given the way in which he is exploited. Goal orientation here is applicable in an adversive angle to which is intended by the theory. The only goal present is revenge. Facilitated by Bunting, he orders and Jamie follows. The retention of norms in this context is paradoxical in its functioning within the internal containment realm. When we consider norms as a social construction of shared beliefs and goals held by a group of people, therefore implying external influence as opposed to internal influence. The norms can be viewed in a dichotomous way, plotting how to extract revenge and who should be at the receiving end of it. Frustration tolerance is seen by the way Jamie is abused by those around him, by Jeffrey, by Troy, and by Bunting himself. Jamie possesses a resilient blindness to exploitation from those around him. The internalization of rules is visibly held through a depraved lens of the morally right and wrong. Murder and torture is seen as just, and to do nothing is immoral. The line between right and wrong is beyond blurred, that it becomes a road leading to the abyss, hiding any clear distinction between good and evil. The pull factors that Jamie is exposed to primarily take the form of group conflicts. On an individual scale, between Jeffrey, the man trusted to care for the boys, the friend of Jamie's disposed of by Bunting for being a drug user, and Troy, his brother, who abuses him. On a group scale, the meetings, which are only held to fan the embers, as they discuss ways of punishing the abusers. The group conflicts that initially happened could be viewed as a precursor to his affiliation within the delinquent subculture. Additionally, the delinquent subculture is seen to be justified in its roots on a historical basis when they compare their atrocities to those committed by Anzac forces, suggested by Bunting when he states, It's not fucking meaning to kick the shit out of some diseased prick. He fucking deserves it. It's an Australian fucking tradition anyway. Look at Anzac Day, for Christ's sake. The whole country applauds a bunch of blokes who killed and tortured men, don't they? Why do they do that? Because they fucking deserved it, didn't they? The push factors that Jamie experiences take the form of discontent and hostility. These are double-barreled in the scene where Bunting asks... Do you like being fucked? and he is forced to shoot the dog as an initiation task into the delinquent subculture. Additionally, when Bunting asks Jamie what should be done about the undesirables... What should happen to him? Fucking kill him. Kill him. However, both of these examples remain questionable as to whether they are displays of discontent and hostility, or sheer peer pressure at the hands of Bunting. Two more push factors are shown. Inadequacy and inferiority. Shown through Jamie's acceptance of being pushed around, the only time we see Jamie happy is when Bunting acts as a father figure in his life. Otherwise, he feels powerless at the hands of those who abuse him. He willingly accepts the hand he's dealt, and who dealt it. Ultimately, Jamie's character arc can be dissected from the nurture debate as opposed to nature. When we objectively measure the dichotomous incorporation of reckless social and personal conflicts, sociological factors play a higher role in explaining, but not excusing, his behaviour. The digression of his morals and the factors baiting Jamie into criminality are out of his hands. The primary reason for this is the codependence that is elicited throughout the movie. Jamie needs Bunting as much as Bunting needs Jamie. The dynamic of this relationship raises questions of accountability. Is it fair to say that the road to accountability is divided at its destination by crossroads? Acceptability and proportionality. How do we reason, rationalize, and weigh the decisions made in light of restorative justice when we consider all things committed as a means to an end? When we broaden our scope and consider the things that happened as relative to their situation, 
then, is there room for redemption?